I don't know. It's like I hate going down these roads with all this stuff. So I'm trying to remember all this negative stuff I've blocked out. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow. 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 People are wondering why I'm saying wow. It's Howie Mandel here. This is Howie Mandel does stuff. You are? Jacqueline Schultz, his daughter. <laughs> Rob, you are. Yeah, and, well, I know who you are. Rob Zombie <laughs> is in the house. Rob Ooh. Zombie. Hello. That's your new voice? Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, yeah that's my scary Bob's big boy voice. <sighs> uh, for those that are just listening, there's kind of a Bobby Bob's big boy on my proto hologram. So he, it's amazing because you see things. And All right. People are listening. That's you true. are inspired. It's a podcast. But people are watching <laughs> on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Also. I was watching it. That's why I thought everybody was watching. Okay. And he just uh, gifted me with the Rob Zombie zombie film the monsters which i was a fan of i haven't seen the film yet i, I know i should have brought the blu-ray i wasn't thinking but uh this that's is on netflix so it's easy to find okay so we'll, we'll we'll watch that i was but uh this is an amazing double disc or disc of all the all the double music disc a double disc of the music you heard everything before we even start like you're a, a musician a producer a director a performer a an entrepreneur you know, which I think is really amazing. You go to horror nights at Universal, yeah, right? Yeah. Right? And a lot of our friends. You guys go, the guys in the back, you've been to horror nights at Universal? Well, I've only been once and then never went. <laughs> because you were scared. I hated yeah. it so much. No, no, no. No, I was so scared. I went when I was, li let me, before you go on, I went when I was a little kid and I went with a group of girls and the moms took us and yeah. we walked in and within 10 minutes, the moms separated. Like none of the kids could find the moms. We were all alone and scared. So I never went back. Because most marriages in LA don't last. So <laughs> all the moms with them just yeah. scatter. They just, just scattered. Suck. But just to, to tell you to, 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 to put this together is I think the very first horror and the reason that they have horror nights at Universal was you, right? Didn't you, weren't you uh, hired to put together the first year of that? Well, they had done it years past. And then I, this is the story I was told. I don't know if it's true. Somebody had gotten hurt on the tram ride like oh their cape got caught in the tram somebody got hurt so they shut it down they didn't do it for a long long time and then in 2000 or 1999 they decided to do it again and that's when i got involved and i did a giant one called i forget what it was called like something based something rob zombie and every room in the thing was based on a song on my record and you walk through this giant head of me like through my mouth and it was this whole big crazy thing so ever since then i've been you know involved off and on Different years. Some years, no. Some years, yes. So your whole, but I, I feel like your whole um, milieu, even in your music, is very theatrical and very um, horror-centric, right? You love horror. Horror inspired Yeah, I mean, that's you. always been the thing that I've, I mean, I love lots of things, but that was just the thing that when it became about music or movies that I gravitated towards to be the inspiration. I mean, I just grew up loving everything. I was like, that's why when you're showing me the stuff out there with the Carson cue card, I'm like, I love Johnny Carson. I would fall asleep in school every day because I had to stay up and watch Carson as a kid, you know? But you love Anything comedy? with entertainment, I loved. All con everything. So did you always know, am I not uh, on camera? <laughs> you're going to focus now? My son just came in to focus. Okay, let's just... All right. Do you, am I, tell me when I'm in focus. Tell me when I'm... I felt blurry. Yeah. Am I in focus? I leave, yeah. Nobody's at, Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody's answering. They're just looking at <laughs> the like, screen, but not answering. They're all me. listening. They're not watching. <laughs> Are I in focus? Yes or no? No. No. <laughs> no. Just keep going. Well, that's scary. All that technology a, out there and <laughs> <laughs> holograms. Can't. We can't focus this camera. No. But we could keep talking because it's a podcast and people can can hear. So anyway. the, the when. In, in doing research and, and listen, I'm a fan and I know your music and I know your movies and I know a lot of the people that you know. Are you friends with Bob Ezrin? Do you know Bob? I do know Bob, yes. I know Bob. You know, I'm from Toronto. Oh, okay. Bob and I work together many, many times. Bob is, for those that don't know, is a, you know Bob, right? Mm -hmm. Is a music producer who was, uh, I, I think his first hit was with Alice Cooper, right? I think so, yeah, because he was really young and then he basically produced every record I loved as a kid. Kiss Destroyer, you know, all Have that. Have you ever Alice worked with stuff. him? No. Well, actually, yes, I did. Actually, um, when Alice when Alice did, uh, we were in Nashville, and when Alice did Welcome to My Nightmare 2, we were on tour together, and I went into the studio with Bob and did some, like, kind of like the Vincent Price talking part for that record. 
Wow. So actually, I did work with them. And now you're, and we'll, we'll plug things, but you're going to go out, you're doing a big tour with Alice now, right? Yeah, we, or, well, it starts in August. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be exciting. I love touring with Alice. We've toured together many times, and it's always the best match. Are you a golfer? No, that's where we part ways, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so I will not see him during the day. I only see him later when he comes in after golf. What is your hobby when you're not doing music or movies, or what do you do? I know you're a farmer. Yeah, I don't really even do that. Um, don't you have a farm? You're a farm. I have a farm. and I didn't know you were a farmer. Well, it's not real. I, farmer is kind of a stretch. D-I-E-I-O. <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> like of land. Like a garden? No. <laughs> there's a lot of land that other people keep well kept, <laughs> other than myself. And we had uh, farm animals, goats, for a long time. But we relocated them to a sanctuary up in Woodstock because it was just... It's too hard to take care of them and be on the road and go back and forth. And, you know, not having animals and stuff. So you do nothing. So I am not a farmer. I'm always working. I don't really have other things that I... That's the problem when whatever was sort of your hobby becomes your career, then what? I need to take up archery or something. Because or you can just love your career. Okay, Mr. And- Joe Rogan. <laughs> oh, does he do archery? <laughs> I think he does. <laughs> do you have chickens? No. Aww. What? He chicken. said he doesn't have animals. You're I know, keep but I, I want chicken, so I was going to see if you wanted to sell me one of your chickens. I don't have any chickens, <laughs> but the people that lived across from the street from us out by our farm had chickens, and they lasted about a week before the fox ate them all. Oh, that's so chickens story. are dicey business out in the country. Okay. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> enough farm, farm talk. But I find, I find, no, it's not boring. <laughs> I find that, that um, in doing research on you and your even your beginnings, it seems to be a... a a path that you were meant to go on. Like as a, a little kid growing up in Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, your parents were carnies. Well, it was kind of like, um, yes, but not like freak show carnies. No, like no. Kind of like, uh, food concessions and things. Like my mom really grew up in that world. And then when she married my dad, she dragged him into it. And then when we were born, we get dragged into it. But as a so kid- we were always we, at a carnival. Yeah, like it was mostly in the summers because we were in school. So summertime, we had to work the carnivals. But they weren't like, they were kind of low rent and always in bad neighborhoods. Right. And so okay. we sort of hated it, but we sort of liked it as kids. I don't know. Well, you, you don't know any different, right? So you're working at a carnival. The, 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 your, your segue out of a carnival, I read, was- um, uh, uh, like a kind of a riot uh, uh, yeah. broke out. There was gunshots, fires. They were burning down tents. You're a little kid at a carnival. Yeah. This at- was, I think, 1977 because I remember, or it was, um, I don't know. It was around that time. And um, yeah, it was just like the typical carnival. You know, all the gambling tents are rigged. So I guess you would- Is just, that true? Well, <laughs> at this show it was. I, don't, I, can't, <laughs> I can't speak for every carnival, but- um, the There's this carnival. really good movie called Carney right. with Gary Busey and Jodie Foster. And that is exactly how it is, that movie. And it's really kind of sleazy. That's the world. Anyway, so yeah, these, these guys were getting cheated on the tents. And I think they finally figured it out. And they were drunk. They came back and the, they lit the tent on fire. But the whole midway just went, whew, just everything went up on fire because nothing was fireproof, obviously. And it was just one after another. And then you started hearing popping sounds and all the guys that worked like the tilt the whirl and all these things started pulling out guns, which none of this I knew was happening as a kid until it happened. And that was when my parents were like, hmm, we're done. It got all crazy and violent. And That's I was, good parenting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, well, they knew if, where if, to if, draw the line. Yeah. <laughs> At the fire and the and shooting gunshots. and then the gunshots and the... Yeah. The last thing I remember was, uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but he was like... He was yelling to me and my brother, because my brother was there too, he was even younger, and he was like, hey, come over here, come over here. And just as he was telling us to get out of the way of the chaos, somebody hit him in the head with a hammer. And it was like, and he just- You saw you that? It? Yeah, it was, he was yelling to us and somebody, yeah. And saw, what did you see? I saw kind of his head kind of bust open and just blood gush out everywhere and him fall down. And, and that's when die? you said, I don't know. What a great scene for a film. Yeah. Like, Carnival life is- amazing let's go to <laughs> disney but just to actually not a lot of kids have actually seen somebody's head bust open and because a lot of your in your music videos and a lot of your movies there's a lot of blood and guts i guess so i was always i was the, remember how they say if you watch too many violent movies and things you become desensitized you do and that was me so i was very desensitized to that type of stuff and I don't know. I re- the funniest thing about that whole carnival incident, I remember going back to school, and I don't know, maybe it was like third grade or something, and you had to write what you happened that summer. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote that 
Yeah, I think most kids were like, oh, we went yeah. canoeing. Yes. <laughs> and and Rob, well, your name's not Rob. Was it Rob? It's not Rob. Yeah, your yeah, first is. name's Rob? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. What, I know that Rob Zombie is not your real name. No, but Rob is my name. That is my Not name. Bob? No, that was my dad. And I, was get, I would always get really pissed as a little kid when someone would call me Bob. Yeah, not to be confused with Bob Zombie, your dad. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's his name. Yes. So, Wait, were you desensitized when that happened? Were you already watching a lot of horror? and? Probably, yeah. yeah. I, it just it, it didn't give me nightmares. It didn't bother me. I mean, I knew it was messed up, but I don't know. There was just, Maybe it was like it just seemed like it was on TV to me. I don't know. I remember just watching, being always watching movies I was too young to be watching. So maybe that was why. And when did music strike you? Almost immediately. Because um, music, the way I got into music back then, because I was obsessed with television, was everything on television had a musical component back right. then. Well, it didn't matter if it was the Partridge family or the Groovy Ghoulies or the Archies or the Bugaloos or like uh, even like, you know, the Brady Bunch would form a band and uh, the Silver Platters and they'd perform. So everything had music. So that's how I got into music. So you, you're interested in music. Do you go and ask your mom or dad to buy you a guitar or was that? Eventually. But at that stage, I didn't really, I was just like a stupid kid. I didn't know anything. Then I, you know, then the TV music led to the monkeys and then the monkeys lead you to other stuff that's more have you met that did you work with the monkeys i worked with mickey dolans he was in halloween he yeah. played he was in one of my movies because yeah. i work with mike nesmith i love mike I, nesmith. I loved mike nesmith i have a like a, a so mike saw me in 1978 and he did this thing he said he, he liked me he saw me on stage or he saw me at a young comedian special and he flew me up north to um for those who don't know, Mike Nesmith was one of the monkeys, and he was also famous. His mother invented whiteout. Whiteout, did you, right? Did you, did yeah, you know yeah. that? So yeah, he did, came did. from this wealthy oh, family. That's crazy. That's Re like the, that's like um, when Romy and Michelle said they invest, invented post-its. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they lied though. Yeah, they lied. This is real. <laughs> Are you sure? I do. Okay. Yeah. I am. <laughs> and he hired me and a guy by the name of Charles Fleischer to come up because he said that uh, I have an idea. We're going to have like rock bands and bands play music. And like radio, you will introduce these these videos. Right. And he called this show Pop Clips. And if you go on YouTube and you look up Pop Clips, he did it for, uh, I can't remember what the name of the network, but it was like Nickelodeon. Okay. Was that before he did Elephant Parts? He might have Obviously. just done Elephant Parts. Okay. Okay. And, and, and they handed in this pilot of me presenting these videos. Right. And they said, well, we're not going to buy this show. We're going to make this a network. And that became MTV. Yeah. So Mike Nesmith and me are the predecessors for MTV. Amazing. How excited are you to be sitting with me today? <laughs> Pretty excited. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you decide, but what I find fascinating about you, Rob, is all the things that you're passionate about, you kind of reach out and do. And maybe there is, there is a connection between music and directing and movie making and movie writing and comedy. Because yeah, I find a lot of the stuff you do funny too. You have a, there's a, there's a comedy element and a horror element. And an I've idiot. always loved comedy and I've always loved comedians. And I was talking about that this morning before I came to my wife, she goes, she's like, yeah, all the rock guys and the comedians always get along more so than actors or something. And then we were like, why is that? And we just realized we both have to create this thing and go in front of people and make it work. I and that's a really weird thing when you're out there trying to, whether you're starting in comedy or music, it's like... Live performing? Yeah, live but performing in that I also way. think it's also like music and comedy. Comedy has a rhythm to it and yeah. it needs that rhythm if you don't have that timing then you can't get the audience in that's to true. that with you there is but every rock star a lot of people in in the rock business want to be comedians but every comedian wants to be a rock star yeah every comedian wants to stand in front of an audience and have them go crazy like you do yeah it's pretty fun <laughs> but you were uh, you were also inspired is alice cooper like i, I find your music and your performance much more theatrical than the average heavy metal band yeah ever. i mean alice cooper was the, i mean the first record i ever bought was a seven inch of jackson five dancing machine i don't hear that <laughs> in what you do <laughs> i but and i had it on a, like a little mickey mouse close and play i was probably in kindergarten and i would just play it over and over like my parents must have wanted to kill me because i would play it you know like any little kid like a thousand times in a row but then 
because a lot of music was on TV. I discovered like Soul Train and American Bandstand and then Don Kirshner's rock concert and things like that. And that's how I first discovered Alice Cooper. And then once I found that, it was like, it was all over. And the 70s was like that anyway, because it was Alice Cooper. It was Kiss. It was Bloister Cult. It was Led Zeppelin. It was Queen. Everything was theatrical. I mean, Alice was the by far the best at it. But even when but, things were theatrical, there is a specific choice to be um, dark. If, yeah, is that the word? Right. But dark is because you also liked scary movies. You liked horror. and Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, I liked everything, but that was the one I related to. And it was, as a kid, as a little dopey kid in like second grade, you know, Alice is like the biggest rock star in the world. And there's like something in my weird mind where I was like, I can really relate to that guy. Like, we could be friends, you know? And there was just something in him where I thought like we're the same person. And as the years went on, I got to meet him. I've known him now for almost 30 years we're so similar even when you look back like oh you ran track in high school and you had this problem then you did that like it's like weird when you meet someone it's like you have a certain path and it, you know obviously not golf but you're a track star i wouldn't use the word star <laughs> are you fast uh fast enough to be on the team but not fast enough to win anything and alice cooper's a runner too he was a runner too wow back in the day and um you learned something but yeah. but you said i could be friend you just but watched you, the what about that was what about because he didn't think about being a track star what about him was more relatable than any of the other music well because that, he had the whole you know he had vincent price on his record and it was all horror related because at that point i was also obsessed with that because you know in the late 60s there was a real horror boom with the Munsters and the Adams family and Twilight Zone and all these things. So it was, it was so much of it. So at that age as a kid, you just I love that suck stuff. it all in. And, and that just defined who I was. You know, I didn't care about, actually, when I was really little, I loved, I was obsessed with hockey, but I think that may have just because it was. Because you live in Massachusetts. Yeah, you have to. You, you have don't to. worship like the me Bruins, from you Canada. have to leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. They make did, you leave. Did you play hockey? I did. Were you good at that? Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was, it was fun. But then it was like, as I got older, the sort of hockey mentality and my mentality didn't match. When I was smaller, it was, I was like one of those little kids on skates, you know? Yes. And you ha I'm noticing you have nice teeth. And if you want to have nice <laughs> teeth, you can't play hockey. <laughs> but uh, so then you, what's amazing to, do you like directing or do you like writing or do you like perform is there something that stands out of all the different things that you do or do, are you just love doing everything i like everything and all of it's a side of my personality so if i haven't played live in a long time i feel like edgy like i need that to get that out but i really like directing because i like being not the you know when you're directing it's not about you it's everything that's in front of the camera and you just have to micromanage this crazy world but it's not like everyone's not looking at you you know you're in charge but you're not what is you're it not to the work. same thing with uh, i always hear comedians say comedians will go off and do television and do yeah. other projects and they always say i'm a comedian at heart if i had to pick one thing it would be to be on stage in front of that audience because that's where I get the adrenaline. That's who I am. Is it not the same thing for you as a performer? Like if you had to, no? I don't think so. You're not a musician first? I don't think, I always wanted to do movies first. That was my obsession as a kid. I mean, I loved music too, but I was pretty um, shy and withdrawn. So the idea, like when I would look at Alice Cooper or Kiss or Led Zeppelin, I was like, if you told me they came from another planet in a spaceship, I'd go, I, I believe that. Like, it didn't seem like you could do that on any level. I mean, I never had any, you know, somehow over the years, because punk rock comes along, you think, oh, okay, there's an avenue in. But, like, as a kid, I was like, it's just, these guys are just special. Um, and uh, same with movies. I mean, living in Haverhill, Massachusetts, I didn't think I was going to go to Hollywood and walk on a soundstage and make movies. It didn't, nothing seemed possible. And it, so you, but you've achieved all of these goals. Not only have you achieved them, but you've achieved them. Not only are you doing them, but the success, like when you, the Halloween movie that he did, you have, you, is it still like the highest grossing? It was the highest grossing for 14 years till that uh, last Marvel movie, the Shang-Chi came out. But and still. That dethroned it. Still, but that could be, <laughs> that could be the highest grossing because now they're charging more, aren't they? Is it, or does well, it yeah, work? Well, yeah, for inflation and you never know. It could, it might still be. I don't know. I didn't check that. You know. I would imagine going, like 
doing your music, you are like she was like Jackie was just saying, you know, as a stand up comic, what I like about stand up comedy is stand up comedy is my world. It's like that's where I control it. That's where I'm hearing in real time the uh, audience response. You can adjust yeah. if you need to adjust yeah. in the moment and play that. I would think that movie making, even as the director and the writer, which gives you probably almost the most control. What about the the corporate power that oversees that? Well, you have a studio or the person that's putting in the money, and and I would imagine they give you notes, and they I, well, you, they do, and it's really that's the worst part about it because what they do is you. <sighs> You know, if someone gives you a note that's good, great. And usually- Well, that's objective, right? Well, sometimes someone will say something. It might be the first thing off their head. If like they go, eh, the third act's a little boring. And you go, okay, I'll look at that because that's like a reaction. But it, when they get really specific, like, I don't think you should say that one word. You're like, give me a break. You're just being weird now, you know? And some, because sometimes you go, here's our notes. And it's like 25 pages. And you go like, if I actually did these notes, the movie would be 12 minutes long. Because that's what the notes always become. They become a scared reaction to like, well, we don't know about that. We don't know about uh, chop, 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 chop. And you see that sometimes in movies. You're like, it seems like there was a good movie here until so someone chopped it all down to nothing because they're afraid. They're terrified the audience will be confused for even one second, which is why you watch movies sometimes. Like, I don't know what's going on. This is so cool. I'm watching. So they always want to oversell everything like everybody's a moron. And that's why sometimes you can watch movies and you can literally predict the lines because they're so generic and they're so, yep, I knew he was going to say that. Yep, I knew he was going to. So for me, that the part I, that I don't like that much is just the battle over the notes because I won't do them. You will not do them. Because I know they're wrong. So it's just a long process of convincing that executive I did exactly what he wanted or doing exactly what I want and convincing him it was actually his idea. I do that a lot where <laughs> it's what I want but I convinced him it was his idea so he could take credit because that's all I want to do anyway is go like, wow, you're, I saved this movie because I told him, you know, whatever. Should be a blue shirt instead of a red shirt on that guy, you know. Kenny, did they, they didn't tell me to wear this. Kenny, you told me I have to. Well, because it's for Butcher Box. We're yeah, talking so about they do Butcher Box. great meats and steaks and chicken, is that why? Chicken, yeah, because they have great chicken. That, well, they have great all, I... Whenever I get Butcher Box, it's mm -hmm. really fresh, high quality meat, and uh, they do the shopping for me. It just comes right to my door. That's, That's what, what I like. I like that. As a mom, a busy mom, I don't want to go to the grocery store, especially with my two kids, because I end up getting like way more than I actually need. So Butcher Box, the fact that it gets everything for me and it's right at my doorstep, and I don't have to make an extra trip to the grocery store, has been amazing. And if they, uh, if they, uh, if our customers if mm -hmm. our listeners from howie mandel does stuff mm -hmm. if they buy it there's a is this part of the promotion is that why i'm wearing this oh because you get free, free chicken, chicken thighs. thighs for a year <laughs> and 20 dollars off your first box when you sign up today that's three pounds of bone-in chicken thighs free in every box for a year plus 20 dollars off your first order when you sign up at butcherbox.com slash howie and use the code howie and uh, claim this deal at butcherbox.com slash Howie and use the code Howie. And they they don't want me to do... Okay, Kenny. They told me to do that? Kenny always leaves us notes. I haven't seen any other ads for Butcher Block, block Box where they've made them Kenny wear said, that hat. Kenny said he's, he's involved in the creative now. Okay. Well, looks good. Back to the podcast. And then a lot of the movies that come out, I think they go by it. I find that a lot of your stuff, not necessarily Halloween because that was a huge opening weekend, but I feel like a lot of your stuff, people find it and then like it becomes following. But yeah. then the people go, oh my God, this is a fucking hidden gem. Well, that happens mostly, I think, because of what happens to is budgets. After, under a certain budget, you can pretty much do what you want. Once the budgets start going up, then everyone gets involved. Right. So I try to find that budget <laughs> where everyone leaves me alone. And I will say it. I will say, this is what I want to do. If you don't want to do it, that's cool. Let's just not make the movie rather than fighting with each other for the what is three a, years. Because I don't know that business. What is the budget that About people- About four million is usually when they will leave you alone. Okay. Once you start going over that. 
And like the Halloween movie, which was a a big success, that was the most crazy with studio ever. What do you mean? Well, it was the Weinsteins had did that. And, you know, now everybody knows the whole Harvey. story. Harvey and Bob Weinstein. I mostly dealt with Bob. But it was just a crazy world. And crazy. Like, did Harvey come on to you? <laughs> no, because you, I, have I long, him you, you have long, brunette, beautiful uh, hair. I would imagine he might have invited you to Not that. his type. Um, <laughs> I don't know. He jerked off in a plant. Is that the plant? I don't have the plant here. Okay. Is that the, is that? You collect a lot of stuff, but you Maybe didn't collect that. that. Yeah. From yeah. Caesar's <laughs> Palace, so You're I right. never know. Well, that is the plant that Harvey Weinstein <laughs> I think you should jerked start, off in. You should put it in the lobby and just tell people that. You're you right. Should. It is a fern. And it came from the Beverly Hills Hotel. hotel. Um, oh, that is great. It's the jizz plant. Oh boy! Uh, isn't took that great it, when you're sitting far. with your daughter and she's calling? <laughs> she the took jizz. it too far. It was she did yeah, the jizz plant. You don't want to hear from your kid. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, apologize. Cross the line. That's it. Time out. Oh, I don't even. Okay, know. so I mean, Harvey plants, Weinstein. So I don't doing, even remember the story. Just craziness all the time. Craziness where like someone gives you definite notes on Monday, but you know, or they give them to you on Friday, but you know by Monday they forgot about them. So you just so I I came up with this trick. I don't. It was kind of like. Um, I made sure they were always, you know, they have your shooting schedule for the day. They were always one day behind what I was shooting. So I had already shot. I don't know how I tricked them because they, they weren't paying attention. But I, they were like, here's what we want done on day 10. Blah, 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 blah. Scenes. No problem. I had already shot day 10. And I was shooting day 11 while they were yelling at me about day 10. And this went on for weeks. Based on what they had seen on the script? Yeah, they were just it's not dailies. They're no, not no, it's not based on dailies. It was just like based on crazy ideas. Like I was thinking last night, it should be this suddenly. And you're like, and sometimes the ideas got so crazy off a path where it'd be like, okay, I think Michael Schmeier should actually be this. And then he does this. And perhaps, he, you know, by the end, he's an astronaut in space, <laughs> you know, because the ideas would just go insane. And then I would just think, okay, I just have to realize I'm dealing with a crazy person and then answer that way. And that's Bob? And just, yes, very cuckoo. And then we would get into these big fights and scream at each other, and he loved it because that's how he liked to communicate, screaming it. And that didn't throw you? That the oh, people no, was, that are writing the trick? It was horrible. Trip? It was three years of that. By the end of it, I was like insane because it was like being in crazy world. And it was all done with negative energy all the time. They would find a way to upset every single actor they were talking to the, your crew and actors and everybody? Well, sometimes they'd come to set. They would very rarely come to set because we weren't shooting in town. But, the, you know, they would, especially on, a, I don't know, it's like, I hate going down these roads with all this stuff. So I'm trying to remember all this negative stuff I've blocked out. Oh, I'm sorry. But it was just, no, it's okay. Um, it's good to it purge it. You'll chaos. feel better. I'm I mean, it was just, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the basic mindset they had was, Every director and every actor is an idiot, and the movie can only be good if we save it because everyone in this town is stupid but us. And that's how they would approach everything. And when you do, <laughs> or maybe because you made them think that all their ideas were put to, uh, were happened, I, mean, I was just wondering if at the, the weekend it opens at over 30 million that you have the, or, or they are. Well, aware that you can go. Nye, 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 nye. Well, this is how that went down. When the movie, when when Bob watched the movie, when it was done, he, <laughs> this is this is how he calls me. Goes, I hate every single fucking frame of this movie. That's your call, really? Yeah, this is, this, no, that's like a note. I hate you. Have to fire your editor. He's a fucking idiot. He doesn't know what he's fucking doing. I hate every. This maybe you're not one, exaggerating. Oh no, I'm not exaggerating at all. This is what it was like every single day. And then, um, how do you go to sleep once it's done? Oh no! Once, <laughs> once I, the movie is done, and it, and he calls a lot too. So your phone's always like, eh, and like oh. And um, so at first you try to appease it, then you're like, okay, they can't appease that. It's just crazy. So, so, so he wanted to fire my editor, who was fantastic, and we hired another editor who I didn't not for I didn't like him, but I didn't need him. So we had this other editor who had been an Academy Award nominated editor, but I didn't need him. So I put him in another room and he just sort of hung out doing stuff, making coffee, hanging around at some really? ridiculous rate he was getting paid. And I continued working with my editor. And then the morning, the, the, <laughs> the day the movie came out, Bob calls me at 10 a.m. He goes, it doesn't look good. This thing's a fucking disaster. It's 10 a.m. I go, Bob, are any theaters even open anywhere yet? And then he calls me like a couple hours later. We're adding more screenings. This thing's going through the roof. <laughs> but then Harvey calls Bob 
and goes, if you had listened to me, we could have done double. So then they start fighting that number one record-breaking weekend isn't good enough. Because I was talking to some people in their office. They're like, oh, it's a nightmare here right now. They're fighting. They're screaming at each other why it's not 60 million. And that's what it was like. And then so anyway, I go to make the sequel, which I refused to do at first because I just went out of my contract because I wanted to kill myself. Did you have a contract with them to do? I had a three-picture deal. With them. Which I said... I left to do nothing because I didn't, didn't want. And then a couple of years later, they had fired 12 different directors for Halloween 2. So I came back. I go, I'll direct it if you let me out of the third picture. So I don't have to do three pictures. I'm the only guy who negotiates lower picture <laughs> deals. Here. I go, let me out of the deal and I'll do it. So I, I go to shoot that and um, Bob comes to the set. He's showing me the trailer for my Halloween as if I've never seen. He goes, Every frame of this movie is fucking genius. Now, this is the Wait. same guy who said every frame, every frame of this movie I fucking hate. <laughs> so, uh, this is crazy. How do, you, <laughs> how do you function under that kind of pressure? I would, it, that would be too much for me to... Well, it, it sounds is, like it's not even pressure, though. It's just annoying. It's right? horrible because it's not... It's, you waste most of... You only have so much energy in your body and you waste most of it dealing with chaos and very little of it dealing with trying to make a but good movie. in the best case scenario, you have a vision... Did you write the script? Yeah. Okay. So you have a vision, you wrote the script, and you obviously, they gave you the green light on the words... Well, that's the funny thing about them. They, they, I will say, I mean, I don't want to make it like everything's horrible. The one, the thing that was really good was when they go, okay, let's fucking do it. They, they mean, let's do it. Like, let's literally start tomorrow and you're instantly behind schedule. Whereas everyone else that I've dealt with when they're like, okay, well, they don't swear like those guys, but they're like, okay, we want to do this. And it and never gets like, done. This, was that the green light? Are we doing this? And then six months later, is this happening? Or two years later, like, I, like the monsters took five years of that sort of, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? Are we doing this? I know that. We're doing place. it again. No, we're not doing it. Whereas like those guys are like, okay, but fucking taking so long. So my point and my question <laughs> is that they say, let's do it. Yeah. You get on a set, having done a few films myself, not as a director, nor as the writer, the director is the epitome, is the is the the nucleus of everything. So every decision, you know, the wardrobe department will come to you and say, is this shirt good? The hair department will come to you and say, is this how you want the hair to look? Every decision, yeah. everything you see on every inch of that screen, visually, audibly, or whatever, is siphoned through the mind of the director, which I think is incredibly oppressive it's got to be an oppressive wonderfully artistically oppressive time for any human being to have to make every decision and not second guess yourself like it's this train that is moving forward i think it's a personality defect that I, people have like I, I like that okay and it drives people crazy like it drives my wife crazy like if we go into a restaurant I'm like oh it's supposed to be really good if they you know, fix the lighting and it was painted those walls a different color and sort of just change the like i find a problem with everything that i want to fix and make better okay so that being said, <laughs> which is annoying, you take you take a phone call each and every night, going, "I hate every fucking decision you made." Yeah, how do you get up <laughs> the next morning and make more creative? Like to me, the creative process is you need the freedom of mind to go. You know how I see it, and it, without second guessing that there is somebody behind my shoulder watching it, hating every fucking right well, or wrong. At first, it fucks with you, and then you just start ignoring it because you know it's just craziness. You know, like at first you think, okay, this, these guys are big producers in the business, Academy Award winning. And then after a while, like, oh, who gives a shit? You know, you just do your own thing. And I, the, one of the best ideas he came up with one time, I was on set shooting, because he would call me the whole time I'm shooting, all night long, constantly. He'd be like, I think Michael Myers should, uh, he should have a necklace of severed ears. <laughs> and meanwhile, I go, well, besides the fact that I hate that idea, we're so deep into shooting. How do we get that continuity? This is dumb on every possible Where does level. he get them? Yeah, where does he get them? How does he have them? Why doesn't he have them? This thing, but he has And that's when I start going like, I'm not sure they know how movies are made. They don't understand we're shooting it out of sequence. We shot that. We left that set. We're not going back. We tore it down. Because sometimes um, I felt so bad. For he had this assistant who I got so mad at one day and, and now I feel so bad because it's not really his fault. He's just the messenger that I wanted to kill. 
they'll <laughs> show up and your days are already beyond packed. And he's like, here's 17 pages of shots Bob would like you to get today. What, on top of what you oh, are. On top of the actual stuff that's supposed to make the movie. And you look and go like, we don't have any of these sets or actors or wardrobe. So I don't know how he's rising from a cemetery that doesn't exist here at the mental hospital set. <laughs> and, and you go like, so I just like would throw him in the trash right in front of him. He'd go, okay, I just had to say that I arrived on set and handed him to you. He's like, he was serving me. And it was just like that every second of the day. And, and it did make me sort of lose my mind after a while. I would, I have, uh, you know, I've been very open about my uh, mental health uh, weaknesses. That would, I wouldn't be able to survive that. No, so that's they, it does make you crazy. Like you start losing it. And the only, and because they only functioned from a place of negativity, because they could never tell you what they liked or how they wanted. They would just tell you why they hated it. You think they were like that with everybody? Like you, you were like, you think they were like that with Tarantino? Probably not because he was such a huge thing for them i would he hope. wasn't huge until they i don't know maybe that i don't know maybe they battled all the time too i just don't know i mean it was i know i've heard other horror stories so i know it wasn't just me because when i wasn't doing halloween 2 a couple different directors who got the job would they're like oh their agent wants the can you talk to them and tell them what to expect and i would literally say to them i go here's what to expect they're gonna hate everything you do and they will fire you and they go, no, really. I go, I'm sorry, but that's what's going to happen. But first, they will probably reduce you to tears or something unless you're screaming, fuck you, motherfucker, back in their faces. Did you do that? Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, because it's either that. You, you, they just like the battle. Because like, they want like, to win and they want to control you. And they try to control you with money because the first question I was asked was, do you have money problems? because I knew that I would need my directing fee because I have money problems. And I go, no, Bob, I have more money than I know what to do with. I'm doing this because I like it. Or so I thought. Um, <laughs> so he's, and he could see, he was like, ah, oh, fuck. How do we fuck with him then? It's not about his paycheck. Oh, really? Well, yeah, if you're a young director, like on your first, on an early film, you're like, oh man, I really need this money because I'm going to get evicted from my you know apartment in North Hollywood. So once they can't, twist the money screws uh, got did, they, did they try to find something that would just fuck with you or i think they tried it with everything but nothing wow. worked because it they, sounds you know, like just mentally right yeah but but you know you just have to be mental back and your very talented uh beautiful wife is that a is that tough to um that's another dynamic that i can't imagine i'm working with my daughter but it's not my wife and even this is tense <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 we, we do have like some tension sometimes i don't know if it's on the air and it's not in this particular episode but we do have tension does that is that ever uh been a a concern um no i mean we don't really worry about it the way other people mention it in a way like because it's like she's doing her job which is very specific just like any other actor and i'm doing mine the only downside is more for her because she knows everything that's going on like the other actors can walk in and go, like, wow, this is so great. We're shooting Halloween. And she's like, I've just heard him for the last year screaming on the phone with the Weinstein. So she comes into it already knowing the shit show that it is. Um, but uh, but what about so tension? That, what about uh, creative um, point of view? Do you share? Do you always share the same creative point much, of view? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, because pretty much because I don't really... Um, I always try to create the characters and the things I'm doing around the people that I, I know I'm casting and how they are and what they can bring to it. I don't usually think like, oh, I'm going to throw this thing. I wonder if you can do it or she can do it. So, yeah, I mean, I trust her. I Like sometimes I'll have a different idea on something and she'll be like, oh, I don't like how that works with this scene. Could I do it like this way? I do that. I'm like, yeah. And it, you know. That's yeah. It. But, but that's you've like always worked in. with your significant other haven't you right from the beginning of time i mean your first group your yeah i mean we always bandmate was a, your girlfriend yeah at back then that was not as whatever that was that was then um <laughs> Sounds like that wasn't as much fun no. sounds like there's a good story there doesn't I'm it? not in that group anymore i know um but, but not because of her or is it i am not in that group anymore oh, <laughs> i sense a yoko and then, no 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 uh, no she was no. more talented no, I just mean. Okay. People blame demise. that's thirty years ago, and I don't care. Okay. <laughs> no, but I'm saying you reason. are consistent <laughs> in whatever your creative uh, vision is. There's all there seems to always be a significant other involved in some way. 
Well, it just like with Sherry, it just sort of happened naturally. We, I was, you know, we met on tour and she sort of like started, it, w- it was not her intention or my intention. It just sort of happened that way. Like she'd be an extra in a music video and then this and that. And sort of with my first movie, I thought, oh, she'd be great for this. And it just sort of like this was this natural thing. It was never really a plan. Well, the, the, it but, but it seems like nothing in your life was really a plan. They were just things that were natural. You know, you're, you're a kid who's loving horror movies and yeah. seeing Alice Cooper. And you didn't go, like you said, I didn't even dream that this could happen. And then, yeah. boom, exactly. you're, like a, you're like a walking, living vision board. I think if you don't chase money, things happen. Like a lot of people I know that make bad decisions are chasing money. You never chasing chased hits. money? No, because you can't. I mean, even when I signed to Geffen Records for the first time, Everything I did was like, they're like, well, you probably shouldn't call the record that. You probably shouldn't. Do. I'm like, I don't give a shit. So kick me off the label. Like that was just always my attitude. Like I want to do the thing I want to do. And if you don't want to do it, that's cool. Let's not do it. Because the bands I knew that sort of changed who they were, toned it down or changed it, they all regret it. And it never works because it has to be you how you are because you have to live it 24 seven. And if you're faking some weird thing, everybody knows I don't think you've ever faked it, but I tell you that what surprised me in, in, and this isn't just because of this uh, interview and it wasn't just for now, but the things that I knew about you, you know, the, the Rob Zombie um, persona and the music is like hard edge, rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock, you know, like yeah. that's what people would kind of identify with, right? Yeah. And no, you're not a sex, and well, maybe you are, but drugs and drugs and you're you you're a are you a vegan or a vegetarian yeah, yeah, vegan so you like you're a health nut you you care about the planet you care about animals you love animals which is seems to be the antithesis of whatever was emblematic from that kind of music or performance no i mean you know yes and no i mean it seems like it what is that thing you have to be calm in your life so you can be chaotic in your work because a lot of the people I know, they're like, ah, they're f- fucking crazy backstage going nuts. They get on stage and it's so boring because they're hungover or they're drunk or they're just dull. And then someone backstage is like, yeah, it's time for the show. They're like, explode. You know, it's, it, there's no relation, you know, between like, I don't know, like, like a football player doesn't walk into a restaurant tackle the maitre d and start beating the crap out well, of them. obviously you don't read tmc sometimes they maybe they do but you know what i'm saying <laughs> but they, they they do but i'm just saying that you're a really right, that's, different. that's um, a concussion related incident. but you seem to be a very compassionate well thought out artist and and obviously that's why you've been able to enjoy success and a, a long career it's been it, it's about four decades now right started really uh well, uh, I think I made the, f- started in 1984. So yeah, almost. Yeah. So, I mean, th- it just seems like forever. Not a lot of people in music or film last even a decade. You can have, uh, you know, a hit. You can do a couple of things. You can work in it. But I mean, you have been, you have continued to be a force. I guess it's because you just always work at it. I'm always worried about it. I'm always thinking about it. I don't like take time off from it. I think about things every day, planning next week, next year, the year after that, trying to, you know, cause like you have to, because. What are you working on now? Well, right now I'm just wor- worrying about the summer tour and the next album. Cause I want to get it. It's been a while f- since I made a record. And then after that. Are you writing the album and the music right now? I was until about a week ago. Um, and? And it's, you know, it's going good. It's a long process. I like making records over a long period of time so that I can live with it. Because sometimes you write something and it's new and you're all excited because it's new and then time goes by, you're like, eh, I don't really, eh, I was just excited because it's new. It's not really that good. But if you live with stuff for a while, you kind of. Do you have a, do you have a um, uh, recording studio in your home? Well, now everything's so easy. There's a little mini one. We have a mini one in here and a little mini one in connecticut so it could just bounce around so when you say you're writing or, or putting together an album it's is it just you in a room or do you collaborate well, it with- usually starts with just me and the producer coming up with ideas mapping out rough ideas and then the band will start i get this idea and this idea. you know it, it just gets never again i mean i haven't like stood in a room with a band and jammed on ideas in, since the early 90s because i just always found that to be really draining you know, you're not a people person. 
<laughs> well, I guess not. I like working with like one guy behind the board and we formulate ideas and you piece it together, kind of like you would a movie. It's kind of similar right. as opposed to like a bunch of guys jamming all day long. And you're like, anyone got any ideas? Not really. Ooh. So how so, close do you think you are to uh, the next album? Not close at all. We just have a ton of ideas and I got to take those ideas, whittle them down, start writing lyrics, see if that makes sense for, you know, futzing around. So hopefully so by ideas next are, summer. are just instrumental now? Yeah, at this point, yeah. Okay, and, and of the new artists that are out there now, what do you listen to? Well, I don't really listen to anything new. So, I mean, I'm in that stage now that every time you see someone on TV, I'm like, I don't know who that is. You don't have to know who that is, but maybe. <laughs> I don't listen to anything. I really don't listen to anything new. I mean, it's but that's the difference now. You know, we are incredibly. I talk to people all the time, especially in for me. I talk about comedy that that um, are. Um, world of delivery the yeah. delivery system of even music now and comedy is so siloed like in music there used to be the radio if something was huge on the radio yeah. whether i liked it or not i knew it was huge and if somebody was going Good out point. and doing stadio, stadium yeah. tours, yeah. I knew who they were. Whether I chose to go and see them or whether I chose to buy their album, I knew that. But now with streaming, yeah. you know, you could be very specific on the kind of things that you want to download. And even social media platforms. There's hits on social media platforms that you will never hear on the radio. I know. It's so weird. I know there are certain artists because that will sell out arenas or stadiums. Well, I was saying the same thing And they're comedy. huge. Yeah. And I'd be like, I couldn't name one song. Whereas back in the day, there were artists that I didn't even like, but I, oh, that's so-and-so. You would just hear it in the supermarket or wherever. Like it just permeated the culture and now it, but that, and that's very different. So I have a, yeah. I, there's just so many comedians. Yeah. I know because I'm really interested and, and kind of have to dive in and figure out who yeah. they are. And especially with podcasts and things like that, they're sure. selling out arenas and I don't know them, or I don't <laughs> know what so they weird. do. Isn't yeah. that weird? It is weird. It is weird. And, and, and I think it's the same thing in music. So you have, you know, but you also have access without traveling, without touring it um, to, uh, you know, kind of uh, implant yourself in the ears of the world without a world tour with this digital yeah that we live in i mean that works i just don't know if that going back to what you said before has any longevity if that's just like oh that's my favorite song right now and now i don't care i think that the part of the rob zombie experience is not only listening to you but watching you i think you are everything is incredibly theatrical and, yeah. pr and it's a pr there's a performance and a look and a you know a patina to everything that you do. Yeah, you can listen to the record and listen to the music, but I think that the the joy, the full experience, is to watch you live. I mean, that's the way it should be for me. I mean, that's how it is with everything. Like, if you never saw Kiss, like never visually saw them, and you heard one of their songs, you go, oh, "Okay, so they're like this rock band." But then when you see them, you're like, "Oh, so they're like these crazy superheroes, larger than light." Like it just it, the like it was funny one day as I loved Kiss as a kid too. And I was walking my dog listening to like, I don't know, Kiss Love Gun or something. I was like, God, these are such simple rock songs. But as a kid, the way I interpreted them in my brain from seeing them in the 70s was so different for what it actually sounds like. It's just so weird. It's just, but Kiss is a show. It takes it to a whole nother level in your brain. Right. Same with Alice Cooper, like, you know. Alice Cooper anyway. was the first person that I was aware of that did, uh, for lack of a better term, like a rock opera, like did a, a uh, you know, a, a show. Yeah, you know what I, I mean? mean? Welcome to my nightmare. He took it to a whole other level. Yeah. And he yeah. was known for that. And th yeah. that was before Kiss, which was also Bob Ezrin, yeah. right? Yep. Bob yeah, Ezrin. Bob, Bob, Bob and Pink Floyd, The Wall was yeah. Bob Ezrin. Yeah, I, know. I mean, he did everything great. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I worked. Howie Mandel worked with Bob Ezrin, so... So did I. I know. Just so everyone no, likes to say. No, I'm that, just bragging no, to your no, no, no. daughter like you are. <laughs> <laughs> she has so you're writing, with Bob So you're writing, you're going out on tour. What about the next movie? I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm doing with that. Because uh, the Munsters just took so long. I, it was, you know, pro, it was like kind of a passion project that I'd wanted to make for like 20 years. And it started and stopped that many, so many times. And the last five years were just dedicated to that. That I'm a little exhausted from the movie process, so I'm just gonna like make a record tour, 
It's we tried to do television together. Out. I'd still love to do that. We want. I, I wanted, wanted to do that. That was going to be good. Maybe we'll <laughs> revisit it. It's like the movie business. You know, things it, it could come back around. At this point, there are new buyers. There are new platforms. There's new. Uh, there, when we were going out, it was just networks. And probably a hundred new stations. Right, right, <laughs> and and streamers and things like that. We should talk even after this, and uh, we wanted to do a uh, kind of a hidden agenda horror. Um, candid, game prank, kind of like candid camera, but scary, but really scary. If I'm remembering it properly, and, but a game, <laughs> but add a game element to like scare tactics. That's cool, you know. And with Rob Zombie, with the king of of doing that, so we wanted to do it. So if you're a producer out there, or you are a buyer from a a, a platform, we're still available. Yeah. Um, Is there any crazy shit that's ever happened on the set of any of your movies? When I hear a lot of like horror films being shot i hear that there's sometimes i think probably people just lie and make up stories really? um you don't believe don't. in the, you don't believe in ghosts no or no i think really hope, just you know if they want to act <laughs> no i i mean maybe but usually it's like if at the time i wouldn't think of it as crazy i would think of it as like you're wasting fucking time yeah the sun's <laughs> going down stop fucking around we gotta get this shot because i i remember one time i was on the set of escape from la I went down to visit John Carpenter and I hadn't made a movie yet. And uh, I didn't know that I ever would. And he said something to me that at the time I was like, Oh, okay. I wonder what that he means by that. And, uh, but now I know what he means. He said, um, movie making is about getting this army over that hill before the sun goes down. You know, You're I right. Like, I was like, Oh, cool. What the fuck is he talking about? But now you know, now <laughs> I know exactly what he's talking about. It, yes. <laughs> and so and we're also friends with uh, scout is a friend of yours. Oh, right. You were, yes, she is. And you I remember one time you were talking about something with her. Doing too, a show. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to do a show of her life. You know, Scout is an actress that's been in a, a few of his. In the Halloween like, movies. In yeah. Halloween. And, and, and then, you know, do you know her upbringing? Like she grew up with her dad. Who she was, was like a, an undertaker or something, her dad? Her dad or? is a mortician's daughter. So she right. learned to, uh, she practiced her first kiss on a corpse. She learned to put on makeup from the lady that put makeup on, on the corpse. And I just thought, oh, what a great coming of age show yeah for sounds like a, a show a, a young girl <laughs> who grows up you know which she learned to drive a hearse that's what she learned to drive on that's funny it is really i funny. didn't know that that part of the story yeah funny. yeah so that, that's a, it's a real story so i just thought you know that would be a great show too i have so many ideas i didn't i didn't want you here to pitch you though i i would die to work with you i'm so thrilled that you came in and talked to us i'm a fan uh, of everything you me, do Howie. and i'm also a fan of your humanity and who you are and how good you are to your friends and your family and your wife. Did your, did your parents get to see your success? Oh yeah. I have to stop my mom from coming to the shows now. Oh, so you, because they're, it? yeah, they're both still like, like 80, I can't forget 84, I think. And my mom's st like my dad, I'm like, he can't make it. It's just too much. My mom still wants to come. I'm like, just stay home. So these 85 year old proud parents are at a Rob Zombie oh, she concert. Was <laughs> yeah. My mom is funny. She, this is the typical thing. Like she like, I was in the supermarket. I don't know how the checker knew I was your mother. I'm like, I got a pretty good idea, mom. <laughs> and my dad did the same thing. He was he was in the hospital last week, which is oh, I'm that's sorry. Fun. But he's like, I don't know how the nurse figured out that you directed uh, the Devil's Rejects. I don't. I know exactly how she figured it out, Dad. <laughs> you told her. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, though. so there's a lot. Of, I wanted the, the one last mom story. The, like this is like she was. I wasn't even living near her and she's sending me pictures when she still lived on the East coast. She's on Alice Cooper's tour bus, like hanging out with them. I'm like, how did that happen? I didn't even get you passes. You just <laughs> walked around bothering everybody till they let you backstage on the tour That's bus amazing. to hang out. And amazing. she's not like hip swinging mom. I mean, she's just like, 84 any, year old any, any mom that <laughs> seems like she's not in no, place. she's probably kind of <laughs> hip. She was a, uh, she was a, she was a carnival worker. Oh, okay. I don't Originally. Know. All right. I and guess. then moved away from that. But I mean, you got to be, you know, I think of that as kind of a fun, a fun life. You know, that it's a, it's a very um, open spirited or an open minded I mean, kind of person. I mean, it's than touring, right? I mean, right. So we so, say run away and join the circus. And in a sense, it's kind of what it is. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Version. And to, and to be of that you know mindset that you can that you would even be in that world and raise your kids at, at, at is kind of a i think a wonderful thing not a 
not a negative thing. No, I, I mean, think- now I like it. And I look back and I thought it was cool and, I, and I'm kind of dig it. I remember my mom telling me that when she was really little, her job on the carnival was to walk around holding a huge prize like she had just won it. Like a giant <laughs> teddy bear. So that's because called you a stick. Ac- because, yeah, because you couldn't actually win it because it was rigged. But so they- I worked at a carnival. I worked at something called the Canadian National Exhibition. And my first job was there was a guy selling, um, there was a booth where they sold uh, magic tricks and they sold uh, magic cards. They're oh, okay. cards that are rigged to, so you can do a magic <laughs> trick. But he would show you all the tricks and that and he'd go, you know, whatever it was, it was 10 bucks a pack or whatever. And he goes, who wants, who wants, uh, who wants to buy it? And they'd give me, I'd be in the crowd. <laughs> I was hired to be in the crowd and I'd go, I'll take three packs. And I would pay it. I'd be the first one to pay. And that started, it's kind of the same thing. So I was funny. called, a, I was hired as, they called me a stick. I don't even know where that, I don't know that term, term came yeah. from. But yeah, I, I, if somebody asked me what I was doing at the carnival or at the exhibition, I was a stick and I was there fake buying at every show i would buy the merch <laughs> and then the, the, out loud so people it's kind of like at the yeah. guys at three card monty there'd probably be a first guy that they were playing who was winning money yeah, fake course, winning yeah. money and then you'd go oh he just won 50 bucks so i'm gonna i'm gonna go in so i was uh, that's what i did so that's why i relate that's to funny. your parents when yeah. i lived in new york watching people lose on three card monty was my favorite activity Really? Well, because I worked on Broadway because I, I was a PA on the first season of Pee Wee's Playhouse, which was on Broadway. Did you know that? They did it in no. this, yeah, they moved it to California after, but the first season was in New York. And right down below, you know, the guys that sit up their cardboard boxes, do it. I would just stand there at my lunch hour and watch the whole time, just watching people lose. I just thought it was the funniest thing. How did you get a job with uh, Paul, with Paul Rubin? With well, Pee-wee it was this production company called Broadcast Arts, and they mostly did television commercials. And my right. friend worked there. He was an artist, and he just got me a job there as like a messenger or something. And then I guess they had done these kind of like really hip, new, wavy Twizzlers commercials. Right. I mean, back then in like, what was it, 1983, I guess they seemed hip and cool. And when Hip they, and cool and Twizzler, you don't hear a lot in the same sentence. I guess they were new wavy and maybe they seemed like cutting edge. I don't right. know. And then one day they're like, oh, we're going to start doing this thing with Pee Wee Herman. They didn't even really even know who he was, I don't think. They sent me uptown to go buy like a video, t- like still when it was like a hundred bucks to buy a VHS tape of uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure or something because they weren't that familiar with him. The movie. Yeah, yeah, or just so, Pee-wee in general. But I don't. Were you? F- I was because I had seen him on some HBO comedy thing the right. first time, and I was like, "This guy's amazing." So I'd always right. So you were on career. the set. Yeah, I, now and then, like there was two buildings. This was the office where they did all the animation, like the dinosaur family and stuff. And then down the street was where they built the playhouse, and I would go there sometimes to deliver stuff. I only talked to Paul Rubens once. He asked me where the bathroom was, and I was like, "It's right over there." Wow, <laughs> that was the only time I talked to him. Wow. <laughs> so, but people don't know that that, that happened. Yeah, it was cool. It was like cool. Uh, people watch that show or know the history of Paul Rubens, but don't know that Rob Zombie directed him to the men. And that season was yeah. amazing because it was Phil Hartman oh, and yeah. Larry Fishburne and all, uh, like there was such yeah, a Larry great, Fishburne was the cowboy guy. Yeah, cowboy Curtis. Uh, uh, yes. And uh, <laughs> Phil Hartman was the guy with the, the, the. Yeah, I can't remember his character's name. There was a lot of great people. Yeah, in that. people I'm amazed that that show didn't come back. Well, it only came I know, back as that one he, Netflix movie, though. Remember, they made a Netflix movie a few years ago. They did that, that was the Broadway. I think they did the Broadway show. They did it on Broadway. Yeah, and then they did the they did the Broadway show, and then you know, at this point in time, you know, the fact that he, you know, you didn't want to be on a Saturday morning CBS show and jerking off in. I remember in a, when that happened. I remember the front page of the New York Post. He had already moved to California. It was like boom, boom. I was like, oh, I felt so bad for him. You such did a, such a good show. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you know, yeah. If you can jerk off in a movie theater, right <laughs> in Florida when you're visiting your parents, I think that was the story. Yeah, <laughs> wow, you remember? You're such a detail person. Rob is always a detail person. Rob, we got to do something together. You Let's gave me uh, so uh, Rob Zombie, the Munsters. Is this available now? The record's out, and the movie. I mean, the movie came out. It's out, been out. It's on Netflix. It was made for Netflix, so it's been on Netflix. But it's, so it's on Netflix, yeah. and the the record is wherever record you get your is record. wherever you can find records. Wherever you get your records, I'm real excited. I want you to sign this for me. Sure. And uh, this summer, Rob Zombie and Alice Cooper Alice on Cooper. tour. And is it just the two of you, or the, who else is on uh, the tour? It's me, Alice Cooper, Ministry, and Filter. So the whole tour is called Freaks on Parade, and it's all of the U.S. and a little bit of Canada. I've heard of Canada. Yeah, you know that's where I'm from. I know. Yeah. <laughs> 
so a little <laughs> bit of my country. Yeah, I forget and, where to go. Uh, please uh, subscribe and to uh, how he does stuff, and you can get merch. I'm wearing it's merch. Howie Mandel does stuff. And HowieMandel.com, <laughs> right? Yeah. And did you have a really good time on this podcast? It was great. Well? Yeah. It was great. Do you watch hockey? Uh, the Leafs were doing okay. They're kind of choking in yeah, the Yeah, and Edmonton didn't do so good last night either. No. That was sad. That will, that's a very <laughs> Canadian Boston kind of conversation happening right now. <laughs> yeah. Which nobody wants to hear. Okay. No, so we're going to get the puck out of here. <laughs> Boom. Hey. <-o. laughs> that was good. That was fun. That was. Thank you. Thank you. I want, how do I, how would I open it so I keep the plastic on, but I want to, I want you to sign it. Oh, yeah.